Assalamu alaikum, hello. Uh, hopefully we will have a very constructive day today. We are here because we are going to discuss a couple of social issues that we face as a community. I will be chairing a couple of discussions today. My name is Firdaus. I'm a playwright and I normally write about the black British experience, particularly the Somali one. What interests and fascinates me is the intersection of race, religion, trauma, migration, when all of those lockheads you get our lives. Um, my latest play is about a little black Muslim boy who on the day our country decided to leave the EU while still in his school uniform goes upstairs, lies down and never speaks, walks, talks or eats by himself again. Research shows that trauma is generational. There is this molecular memory that gets passed down through generations so that children and children's children who have never experienced trauma before will feel traumatized even though they have not been part of a traumatic experience. And I wonder if that is what is responsible for some of what we experience as a community. Today's session will be in two parts. The first session will be about autism and we'll have Noura Abi joining us. She will have a one woman show called Yusuf Can't Talk, which is about her experience with her child who has <coughs> autism. In the second session today, we're going to discuss the relationship between young children's behavioral problems and how that's related to them ending up in prison later on in life. So let's get started. We are going to begin with the fabulous Noura, who's going to inform and engage and entertain us with her one woman show. It's called Yusuf Can't Talk. Please join me in welcoming Noura to the stage. I wanted to do this play because um, I mirror my journey through this journey where um, I felt very isolated when my son, Zach, was diagnosed with autism. I felt I was isolated from the wider community and also the Somali community. People did not understand what autism was and they, I struggle to be part of the Somali community as well as the wider community. And I wanted to change that for families who is in the same position as me. I want to be able, I wanted to see that parents can go out and be part of the Somali community as well as the wider community in a way that they accept their child and the community accepted their child. I wanted to break the barrier and feel part of the society, even though we have got a different children, a child who is going to shout, who is going to possibly destroy a place that you go to, the wider community. I wanted people to accept it, our children for who they are and help them so that we don't feel isolated and disengaged. He doesn't eat well. Yusuf can't talk. He's not like other children. He's not like his brothers and sisters. He want to be on his own all the time. The nursery is worried about him too and they asked me to consult a doctor. Hello, Mrs. Abdi. Hi. Thank you for agreeing to see me. Um, I have observed Yusuf now, and um, I have a few concerns about him. 
What do you mean? Well, to begin with, I called his name and he appeared unresponsive. He didn't seem to see or hear me. But will he give you eye contact? He's only three. If you talk to him, will you talk back? No, but I see him make noises and if he can make noises, he will talk. If you smile, will he smile with you? Honestly, if you see him smile, it's beautiful. He can smile by himself, so if he can smile, he will smile with people. If you laugh, will he laugh with you? Honestly, if you see him laugh, it's beautiful. If he can laugh, he will laugh with people. He's only three. He will grow up. Have you ever noticed him staring at things for long periods of time? Listen, I think Yusuf is going to be a genius. That's his way of trying to understand how things work. He's, uh, he takes time. He's not like other children. I think Yusuf is going to be very intelligent. I observed him staring at a moving light for three minutes. And that's what I'm trying to say. He takes his time and he likes to understand how things work. Yusuf is going to be a genius. Will he play with other children? Listen, he plays by himself and he can, if he can play on his own, he will play with other children. I was very conservative when I was young, um, so he's just like me. He's going to be a genius. Do you think that he's developing at the same rate as other children, reaching the milestones he should for a boy of his age? Listen, what are you trying to say? Yusuf is only three. Okay, Mrs Abdi. Um, I believe your son has a complex neurological disorder called autism. I didn't understand a word you just said. What do you mean by autism? I don't know what autism means. My son is going to be genius. He stares at things and takes his time. He's going to be fine. Well, autism affects his social interaction, his social communication and his imagination. It is a lifelong condition and he will always have a serious deficit in these three areas. But what you must understand is all children are different. No child will be exactly like yours. Are you saying Yusuf is mentally ill? No, I'm not saying your son is mentally ill. But the National Autistic Society has a very informative website. Maybe you could look at that and begin to understand the basics of autism. Listen. My son is fine. I don't know why I came to you. My mum said, don't listen to these people. They don't know anything about us. My son is fine. He's going to be a genius. I have to go. I'm so confused. I didn't understand a word that doctor just said. What does she mean by autism? I haven't heard of autism before. I need to speak to my mum. What does she mean by autism? But there she is, my mum doing her pancakes. Mom, can you speak all you do is that? Listen, <coughs> Mom, I saw the doctors today and she said, Yusuf has autism. Do you know what autism means? I'm happy to say that I'm going to be a Your son is fine. There's nothing wrong with him. I don't know what autism means. He's fine. Don't listen to these people. But Mom, the doctor is really worried the way he looks at things and he stares at things. She speaks as though he was mentally ill. I'm so confused. I told her how genius he, he is. But I'm so confused, Mum. Shaitan is coming out. There's nothing wrong with your son. He will grow out of it. There are other children in the family who spoke late. One day we're seven or eight. He will be fine. Hali shaitan kis kana rokim stada skar antat kani yani kwalen e. Thanks, mum. Every time I speak to my mum, it's so comforting. But every time, it's so challenging. It's very difficult dealing with Yusuf. Going out of the house is a real problem. When we go out, he hits people, he grabs people, he breaks things. And people look at me and say, why don't I discipline him? His sleep is a real problem. At night time, he doesn't sleep. He's up all night, puts the switch on, on, on and off throughout the night affects all my other children and go in the morning to places I'm so tired 
Going to places is another problem. I end up being late every time I go place, different places. He takes labels off the clothes. In summertime, he liked to wear winter clothing. And in winter time, he liked to wear summer clothing. And people look at me and say why I'm late every single morning. They just don't understand. There she is. That crazy woman with a big car. Have you seen her son? She holds his hand all the time and breaks everything. Did you see all the benefit? It must, she takes so much benefit for him. Did you see her big car? She must have done something wrong in her life. That's why she deserved to have a son like that. Stop. You cannot judge me. I didn't choose to have a son like that. It's not my fault. You can't talk to me. You can't talk about me like that. I know what people are saying about me. That's autism for you. Well, thank you for agreeing to see me again, Mrs. Abney. Um, after gathering evidence from other professionals, I am now able to diagnose your son with autism. Do you mean that meeting where all these people were talking about my son? I hated these people. Your face was the only face that I could recognise. I understand that meeting must have been difficult for you, but I can't make the diagnosis alone. It's a multi-professional process. A speech therapist, an occupational therapist, a psychologist, they all needed to assess your son. And together we have come to the conclusion that he does have autism. But you don't understand, Doctor. My mum don't understand. My, commu my community don't understand. No one understands what's it like having a child like Yusuf. It's so difficult. I do understand that it's difficult for you, but you must accept this diagnosis so that we can move forward and put things in place to support you and Yusuf. I do think the best next step for you would be to go on the early bird course where you'll learn the basics of autism and meet other parents who are in a similar situation to yourself. Do, do you think there would be other Somali parents in that course? Because I know they're going to be talking about me. There may well be other Somali parents there because autism affects people from all different cultures, all different communities. There'd be lots of different people from different backgrounds. But you might meet somebody that you can connect with and have a shared understanding and then you might feel less isolated. Listen, I can see there's something wrong with Yusuf, but I just wish my family understand that there's something wrong with him and that I get him help. Thank you so much for your time. I will think about it. I need to go back to my mum. She needs to understand that I need to get Yusuf help. There's obviously something wrong because the doctors know what they're talking about. We need to get him help while he's young. But there she is doing the pancakes again. Listen, mum, I saw the doctors again. We really need to get use of help. There's something wrong. If we don't get him help now, I don't know what's going to happen. Can they, can they give him medications? Will that take him away? Listen, mum, they can't give him medications. Medication will not take away the autism. We need to go to the courses the lady mentioned, the doctors, when I saw. We'll take him back home. Milk, come on, milk, and that will take away the autism. He will be fine. Mom, I'm, I'm just so worried because the doctor is so worried. But thank you. One day, I was walking near a park and I saw this Somali mother running after this little boy. And I went up to her and said, is this your son? Has he got autism? She looked at me thinking, why is this a stranger talking to you? And then I said, I got just one like him. And then I thought, if there's two of us, 
then there must be more. And that's how we set up Autism Independence, an organization that supports families affected by autism to have safe place that they can support each other and talk to each other about the autism and how they can help their children access support. And then we started talking about our other children and they, how they coping with the autism. Another mother talk about how her other son is coping in a mainstream school. And so here, ah, That's right, come all the way up. Down and flick, and, and then down here, can you write please? So go all the way down. Wait, all the way back up. And around. Ah. Uh, oh, boy. Ah. Uh, okay. I'm going to write. So I want a good picture. And what comes at the end of your sentence? Renika. A full. No, we don't want to do that. Full stop. Do a full stop then. Okay. Ready? Full stop. You do it. You do it. Full stop. Back up. No gut up there. Yeah. How are you doing? Right. Renika. A full. Ishmael with autism making so much progress and then I started opening up and talking about some of the challenges that I face with my son with autism and actually how he now made progress and where he is. Okay, so can you find something you use for drinking? Good boy, well done, do this. Time. What is it? Two. Excellent. Well done. SpongeBob Square. Pen. Excellent. Can you find the hair? Okay, to give it to me. Well done. What is it? Duck. Excellent. What does a duck say? Quack car. Well done. The cat in the hat. Good boy. The sun did not shine. It was too wet to go play, play. So we sat in the house all that good, good wet day. Excellent. That was Zach, my son. It took years and years and years for him to learn to talk. And was worried that social services would take his son away from her. But she was very lucky to come to our group because other parents were there to support her and tell her how social services don't just take children away, they can be support. And then we started to talk about our other children and now how they are coping with this other children, with, with our other children with autism. Hi, oh, because he hurts a bit, because he hurts me a bit, but but he is a really nice brother, and I, and, and it's difficult. He always runs away, and I try to get him. Uh, yes, it's uh, difficult to uh, having a brother who has autism because um, he's. Uh, we have to spend more time with him, uh, unlike we could do any other stuff, like. Uh, do play with our friends or go out more. 
and he sometimes like he goes to trampoline yoga and it and it, it's I don't really sp well I do spend time with my mum I do have enough time that's true and but he, he, but she normally spends time with Zach because she, he, Zach has a lot of things to do and, and more and more things to learn. The awesome thing about Zach is that he always give me that, give me, he always give me that happy face. When, when he does something funny, I laugh. And when we watch things, we oh, when we played in swimming in Easter, he pushed me to the floor and well, in the swimming, it was so fun. A positive uh, thing about Zach uh, is that he's very happy and um, he's very excited, like exciting to be with. And he's uh, he whenever you're sad or upset, uh, he will come over and he'll cheer you up and which is kind of good because he actually understands how you're feeling. He's, he is very fun to be with. I often worry that I don't, I don't spend enough time with my other children. But it's lovely that they understand and that they are on board. I never thought Sack would say mum. The very first time when he said mum was so special. And it brings joy every single time now when he says mum. But with us, the Somali community, there are many, many challenges, language barriers, community barriers, and cultural barriers. And that's why it's so important that we raise awareness and that there is and there are platforms that families can come. Our children do not need to be hidden. It's an issue and that we need to be talking about it. I want to share some of the other successes with my son and some of the more progress he has made since. Today he's 19 and he leads a very fulfilled and happy life. works with universities to understand the experience of services with communities. We've got two publications online about these sort of services in the Somali community. We work with theatre companies to raise awareness, ACTA, which we did in collaboration with um, Yusuf Can't Talk, and we work with local authorities to help them understand the cultural barriers and how can families and children can access the right support. I hope you enjoyed and has been a learning for you. Um, thank you so much for your time. Um, it's been lovely to share in my story with you and the progress and some of the challenges that I had gone through with my son. I did this because, just as I said there, 
the very first time when Saki was diagnosed with autism, that's exactly the same questions I had with my mother, and obviously because there's no word for autism, and because there's no concept of autism, there are serious challenges for all these children to get the right support. Um, and so I wanted to think out of the box and see what other thing, how could I raise awareness, what could be another form of communication to really share sensitive information that could help families and the community understand the autism. Um, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I want to thank Ingrid um, from Acta Theatre, who without Acta, this would not have happened. Um, Nora, thank you for that. It was very moving and um, informative. Um, tell us why you decided to showcase autism using art. And was it something you had done before? Um, I haven't really used art before to talk about anything before. It was, it was the dealing with the autism that really made me think, like I said, out of the box. When Saki was diagnosed with autism, it was the challenge within the community because of the stigma that came with the autism that has taken most of my time to deal with than really to focus in on helping my son to access services, to make progress and learn and so on. And so I wanted to find a different way to really communicate with the wider community within the community sort of the Somali community. Um, and I remember once going to this um, show that was um, showed by ACTA, um, and we was cross, it was called Crossing Borders. It was families coming from Somalia <coughs> and coming to the UK. And I remember a couple of years back when I wanted to do something about the autism, I thought, that was the best way that I could try and communicate really sensitive information and what life is like in the home environment and within the community to a wider audience so that professionals can learn from the cultural barriers and the community can understand what is it actually like living with the autism. And so I'm actually quite surprised that I could stand on stage and, and, and sort of like talk about some serious stuff, um, which is quite personal, but in the hope that parents would come out and talk about their children and will access services because you know it's absolutely vital to 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 get early intervention when after a diagnosis of autism. Does that mean you uh, approached ACTA with this idea and how did they take it? Yeah, exactly. I remember sitting in my car one day um, and then I rang them and said, listen, I really want to talk about autism use in art. Um, is this something you be, would be interested? And they invited me to come, you know, the following week. And it was like, yes, we definitely would be interested to be involved. And, mm. and, and that's how it started, yes. And did you think at that point you would be performing yourself? No. Right. And and when did that happen? Um, so, ACTA started coming to our group, um, and it always started with ideas. And, and Yusuf can't talk, it's not about my son Saki, but Yusuf, you, uh, and Yusuf represents all of the other women who were members of Autism Independence. And it took the, about a year to sort of like come up with different ideas until we all agree to this version. And no, at that time, it was never in my mind I would act or I would sort of lead. And now we would come to a yes. woman. So before that, it was four women, all with children with autism. And then right. three women, three, three of us, two other girls. Yeah. And then now, a woman with children. They left you to me. it. Yeah, they left it all okay. to me. <laughs> and how, did, how does it feel when you had to perform it? by yourself for the first time? Um, it was different because it would have been nice to see other, you, you know, it would be nice with all of us, you know, you know, yeah. acting it. But I guess it's the passion and because it's so personal to me yeah. and that I don't want to, you know, for me, you know, the goal from this is that I never want to mirror myself. I never want to mirror my situation 
with other families. So it is more for me to never see what I've gone through myself, you know, within the family, within the community. And do you think using art in this way makes it easy to discuss, like you referred to autism as a sensitive issue, do you think it makes it easier for people to access difficult subject matters? Absolutely, because it was deliberate to call it use of can't talk, that can't talk was mm -hmm. interpretation of the autism. And so that it, uh, you know, it makes people think, what does use of can't talk mean? And, 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 and so, to, um, for, so that when families come that they understand. I think it is very sensitive information because you know, the stigma attached to it from a, a, a sort of like the, the sort of the symptoms so closely related to the symptoms of mental illness. Um, right. and, and looking back to some of the sort of um, literature within sort of like from the community, um, is that normal or not normal, not having anything between? And people become, you know, people get very concerned seeing something that's very different and yes. close to the sort of like the mental illness, yes. So you mentioned that autism is not a mental illness. Can you tell us what you think autism is? Um, it is a developmental disorder and mental illness does not go the, um, the sort of like that sort of under the section of mental illness, right. but a, a, a disorder of the brain. Um, and that is what autism is, is, is the parts of the brain wired differently. And it affects different, it's a spectrum, so it affects yeah. different children in different ways. So, so what are some of the ways in which it might affect a So yes, person. this is a spectrum. You know, you can find a very severe end or you can find very mild end. And the way it affects them, it is the communication, the behavior, and the sort of that imaginative um, ability that we have with autistic children. They are very fixated into sort of their sort of that logistic way of seeing things. Mm -hmm. They don't see things in a, in a sort of like a bigger way. Yeah. You see it from that sort of from their eyes from sort of that, they, 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 rigid. they see it. rigid, sort yeah. of very rigid, um, yeah. Perspective. Yeah. Um, how would a parent who has a toddler say, know what signs of autism? Because I think you can, by about two or three years old, you might be able yeah. to tell yeah. if a child has. What are the early signs that a child might have so, autism? So, no eye contact, um, no interaction or engagement, with sort of other people, um, not playing, mm. sort of like other children, but more of like lining up things. It's very different with every child, but one of the sort of classic symptoms of autism would be sort of no eye contact and lack of engagement. Right. And no sort of, um, because you know, from baby onwards, sort of that, that innate ability within babies to sort of want to interact with you with mm -hmm. autism, sort of, they, they, they don't have that sort of inter interaction ability that they want to sort of have exchange interactions. And how early can you see those signs in a, in a um, child? Well, they, from two onwards, I believe, um, from now, well, now it's from two onwards, but before, that it was much longer. Yes, because it's a lot more, people know about it a lot more yeah. now, so yeah. you can get an early diagnosis. Absolutely. But I guess for me, my concerns are within the Somali community or communities where English is their second language, that could get mixed up with the autism because often I come across mm -hmm. families that I work with who would say, well, because of the two languages, that's why they're not talking. And it's just the language and the communication. It's not the only sort of signs of autism. It's that whole... Um, you know, being engaged, being understa the understanding of it, yeah. um, that, that's the key to just the communication. Um, I just wanted, you probably know about this, but I just wanted to read out to, um, to the audience a little bit of research that the University of Minnesota carried out a study, particularly within the Somali community, because as we know, the largest Somali community outside of East Africa is in Minneapolis. And they um, did research into seven to nine year olds in Minneapolis of Somali origin. And they, what they found is um, the Somali heritage children with autism also had related intellectual disorders defined as scoring 70 or less on IQ tests compared with a third of autistic children in the study overall. So what they're saying is it sounds like it hits 
Somali children harder than it hits other children. And also part of the research was a comparison into other ethnic groups and it found that it's quite high within Somalis and it's quite high within the white community, but it's lower in other black communities and in the Hispanics and the Asians. Yeah. Um, would you say that's something that you're seeing here in the UK? That Abs more absolutely, serious? absolutely. In terms of the intel intel intellectual side of things, mm. definitely it is much more severe um, within the Somali community in, in the UK and other parts, and that's something most of the research that has been done within sort of the Somali, you know, involved with the Somali community have seen, um, and that is pretty much the case in Bristol. So, so UK specific research is showing also. It that there's the severity is worse within the Somali children. Identifying yes, that there's more severity of autism yeah. within the, in, in the Somali community. Um, has any research been done in the UK as to why they think uh, it's so high within the Somali community? There hasn't been any research anywhere that has looked at mm. why there high, why there are high incidence of autism in the Somali community. But early research that identified has been done in Sweden. And then right. this was the follow up from Sweden. We've just completed a research in, in Bristol University with two research publications, but it looks at the experience, but has got um, all the data of other research that has identified some of the points that you just highlighted. So it sounds like what we really need it's is so much the case and see that on the ground and you would find a high number of Somali children in <coughs> special needs school and the numbers are very high all the local authorities in in Bristol and all the areas that has got high populations of the Somali community and these children are very severe um, and that is something that has been picked up in in local authorities um, I wonder Within the community, definitely, anecdotally, there is this um, belief, let's call it that, that maybe autism is something that is a diasporic condition and that we did not suffer from this back in Africa. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, the, the numbers are certainly very high. Yeah. Looking at um, sort of like the diaspora community, but I have gone back home and came across autistic children, but very rarely. Um, there's obviously questions about that. Is it to do with not having um, a system that diagnoses? Do we? Is it because of the lack of the system, uh, healthcare system that we we don't have that cannot diagnose, or is it to do with the fact that? The numbers are low, it's unknown, but I, that is, you would say that there's higher incidence of autism in, in diaspora Ch Somali, Somali families. And yeah. this is global, right? It's, yeah. it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's not specific Sweden, to you. Mm -hmm. In Sweden, Minnesota, and the UK, you would come across large Somali numbers with children with autism. Um, some of the causes of autism that I've read are genetics, a combination of these things, older fathers having children, and mothers during pregnancy being exposed to either infections or stress. We'll come to a little bit of that, the research that you've done, but have you come across just within the Somali community, um, if one of those conditions might, might be more relevant for us than the others? The stress and the trauma side of things would be definitely something that could fit in within why there is higher incidence mm. of the autism um, but the other factors the genetic, genetic side of things that's sort of a global um, point that has been picked up yeah. within the Somali community I, I'm not sure about that um, when you say trauma do you mean trauma that of the mother who is pregnant is she a mother who is born and bred in the UK? Is she a mother who has been born in Somalia and is now having a child here in the UK? Who is this mother that's experiencing the trauma and the stress? I, I, I think it could be both because, because I think the lifestyle is very different to how the setup is in Somalia um, back home. And, and I think because of it could be both, but specifically mothers who 
flee war or any other reasons have gone through you know different types of trauma yeah. or you know you know settling down in this country itself is it migration is stressful, yeah, migration whether you exactly. want to migrate or not, exactly, it's stressful. Exactly. Yeah. So it could be all these factors, but I would definitely say in one way or the other, there are different forms of traumas that has, you could relate to, mm -hmm. that could be a factor, the stress sort of factor would definitely be something that I would relate to the Somali community. Right. Um, now you worked with an organisation with a very long name, uh, CLAHRC, and you carried out some research with some specific aims aimed at the Somali community and your aims were to see how autism is seen and understood in the Somali community, how parents find out that their child is autistic, the experience of the parents uh, with the health and the social care system and how health and social care services can best support these families. Can you tell us what you feel were the most important findings that you had from your um, research? So the reason of that research, as you highlighted, was to really understand accessibility mm -hmm. of services. So the experiences, why there is, why the Somali community are struggling to access mainstream services. Right. Um, because there are so many different services and, 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 and language being a, a factor I wanted to understand what could be other factors. Um, and what we found from that study was to, what we found was the fact that surfaces the understanding of the autism, the, the understanding of the Somali community, but also the lack of concept and not understanding autism being one of the key factors to why autism, to why surfaces were not accessed by the community. So mm -hmm. that was really interesting to really then see what could be done and how could this sort of findings um, be used to, to sort of um, to influence different <coughs> institutions and services to help families access by dealing with that understanding and that sort of early stage yeah. for families. Because uh, early stage diagnosis is Crucial. It is absolutely crucial, and that's where it starts to access the right support or not. And for the Somali community, the minute that they are told that there's no word for autism, right? The minute that they don't, you know, you've got an autism. I remember when we were carrying out the research, one mother said, "When the doctor told me your son has got autism," and then they explained, I laughed because I'm like thinking, "What are you talking about? I don't really understand what you're right. saying." because I don't believe, just like I was acting there, yeah. I don't understand and I don't believe what you're saying and I know my son's fine because he looked normal. Right. Um, and, and, and I think that is the biggest issue for the Somali community, the early stages and building better understanding and a word for autism. So the lack of understanding and acceptance of autism yeah. gets in the way of people actually accessing the services it that they need to. Because there's no concept. You know, language barriers one thing. Mm. The lack of concept is right. a completely different issue for the Somali community. Because if you don't understand a word, you would find another word that explains for you for that word. Right. But if there's no concept or understanding, um, because learning disability is something that we talked about or exists right. from the Somali literature. Um, and that is where I see as the gap is, and, and could there be a word that could be invented, or a word that could be fine yes. for autism, that that early stage would be, that would help. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the ways in which we don't do ourselves favors? So you mentioned a little bit about how um, the shame hiding your child and your child's condition. And thirdly, the mistrust of social services. How do those three combine together to uh, make things difficult? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think one of the things that helped me, and I could see answering that question, I think is understanding the autism and the system that supports it. Um, I understand 
because I've been there why I was hiding Zaki from the wider community. Because why were you hiding him? Because it, he, he, he was different, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, and of course we know from, f you know, family face is really important. He was different, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, and, and that is, you know, I was, you know, reaching, you know, towards the cultural attitudes that, right. you know, I was falling into. Um, and I think I would say, by really dealing with that sort of understanding, and, and, and because, you know, Saki leads a happy life. Um, and there was a, this professor called Temple Grindon who says she has autism herself in America, that people with autism are different, but they are not less. That's right. And I think what is key, it is understanding what they're dealing with. And if they understood that, I believe it would reduce this sort of shameness and the stigma that w that's with it. You know, and I guess also more awareness of the condition, more platforms that autism can be talked about. Um, and I think that that's where the work needs doing. We are not doing ourselves favors because of, because of a, a grassroots issue yeah. And it goes back to that sort of not knowing what they're dealing with. And I think once you know what you're dealing with, you know, you're in a better position to then understand and or explain or do it. something about it. Yes. Um, that's what we get wrong. But as a community, we do get some things right. So what are we good at when it comes to dealing with a child that has autism? What do we get right? Um, I, I think um, especially Somali parents are extremely dedicated to do all they can for the child. Um, I cannot describe what I have gone into for Zaki and some of the other families I work, you know, I work with. They will go miles and miles and miles and miles. Um, and I think it's such a shame that there isn't more work around it back home and here that could <coughs> empower them to be mm. in a better position to even give them more or do more for their children. And some of the families I work with now would, you know, would do anything to get the right support, even if that means they can hide it, but they would do it in another way that no one else would see. And so I think I would definitely give 10 out of 10 to so many mothers for, you know, anything for their children, yes. And fathers? I would give them five, I think. <laughs> five out of? Five out of 10, only because I think it is easier to say, you deal with this problem. Mm. And I can tell you, as a, as a sort of wearing my parent hair and a professional hat, <coughs> by having that consistent support From for the parents. young person with autism, school, mom and dad, and the family, it can change the child's life. And that's why, Saki is where he is today. He talks, he reads, he writes, he's happy. He has even got a job. Oh, um, <laughs> but he will always have the autism. Yes. And he, need, he has got one-to-one -one support. Um, and autism is four times more likely to happen to a boy than to a girl. Yeah. So it's crucial that the father stay involved in the child uh, in the yeah. life of a... Of a, of a boy with, with autism, yeah. any boy really, but yeah. you know, particularly a child with yeah. autism. I would strongly advise, like fathers, <coughs> autism, you completely sort of change your involvement with the, with the child. But there are amazing fathers out there, so Always. it's, it's just sort of understanding again, going back, what can we do to get more fathers involved? We did have three fathers <laughs> took part in our study, so we interviewed 15 families, Three were fathers who were extremely involved with their family, you know, with their child's life, and you know, done all their research and their understanding of the autism, how they deal with it, gone to the trainings available to them as the child get diagnosis. So yes, more work, but great fathers out there. <laughs> um, so what should a parent do if they have a toddler and they start to see signs? Who's their first port of call? Where should they go? The health visitor would, do it, would be their first call. Do they still have one at that age? Um, I think I mean, they I see know. one about two when they do the assessments mm -hmm. of the uh, milestone 
in child development milestones they right. do at the age of two and um, it would be starting with the health visitor and then it would be going to the doctors um, some families from mainstream families would fight to get a diagnosis because that's the only way they would get help our Somali right. parents would fight not to get diagnosis in a certain extent and I would strongly 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 advise you to keep an eye and understand you know that child child stone development um, what age does a child should be sort of saying the first first words what age they need to be sort of like um, using their fork and knife you know how are they behaving you know I think because I, you know as a child in back home we grow up being a young people as a child yeah. immediately you become part of that sort of wider society and you grow up within that um, but in here it's very different you know you it's you and the child in the house you don't have that whole environment wider the whole wider community supporting you um, and it's then becoming more involved and understanding well, what level are they doing what level are they sort of um, developing so um, tell your health visitor so tell health your GP the GP and if they started a nursery um, but definitely the health visitor and the GP and, 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 and you know hi, tell them everything that they do I remember the very first time when it was definitely very clear that Sack had autism. I took him to the hospital and they wanted to do further tests. Um, and they were like, no, this is not just, you know, you know, the hearing things are fine, everything else is fine. There's something else different. And, and you know, I wouldn't, you know, I, I didn't want to hear that. I wanted mm. to tell them that everything was fine. I wasn't being very honest about sort of like all this stuff that they picked up in the assessment that you know they were highlighting to me so you know be very honest about it because what is vital for a young person with autism is the early they've been put the right support in place the better the their better, outcomes yeah, yeah the better for outcomes yes um are there any somali specific organizations around the uk that deal with autism support p uh, parents who and children who who have autism either in London, Bristol? Um, Can you name a few? You so we have any? Autism Independence, which is the organisation I found. Support is, you know, mainly specialised in the Somali community, but provides um, training for professionals about the cultural barriers um, around independence and exercise and, and so on. So for the time being, um, that's sort of like main autism independence but there are other sort of organizations i think which i can't remember their names off the top of my head right now um so yes how easy are they then um to find can people google and find out could they get in touch with you if they're based in london and you could um so, signpost yes yeah, so definitely based? yeah we do outreach work um, okay and, and we do work with sort of um different sort of local authorities or families um, but yes, there are other um, Somali professionals within health um, in this relevant, relevant to autism, so speech and language therapists. There is a lot of um, occupational therapists. I think we've got one in the audience today. Um, How can people find you? Find you so, have a website? Yep, we've got a website, www.autism-independence.org. And, and we're on Twitter at um, Autism Hello and at on Facebook at Autism Independence. But you know, if you put Autism Independence Nora Abbey, our organization will come up and be more than happy to um, have consultations or mm -hmm. sort of like a chat and, and, and so on. Nora, thank you so much for joining us and uh, teaching us. Appreciate thank it you. and thank performing you. for us. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you.